What's good, family? I can say like David, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Listen, the Spirit of God was heavy in the service today, and this message today is going to bless you. We're still in the series entitled The Construction Zone, and today's message is critical, especially for those who are standing on the sideline. It's entitled Stay Out of the Comment Section. Don't watch this by yourself. Get a family member or friend as we get ready to go into the Word. And remember, stay out of the comment zone. I'm going to invite you to stand with me to your feet as we go to the book of Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. And we'll begin together at verse number 1. Nehemiah chapter 4. And we're going to begin together at verse number 1. When you get there, just say, Pastor, I'm there. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse number 1. I just need to do a quick check. How many of us need a word from the Lord today? I just need to know where to aim. Amen. Some of y'all didn't raise your hand. I guess y'all don't need no word from the Lord today. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 4, and we're going to look together at verse number 1. Again, when you find it, just say, Pastor, I'm there. And this is for those who are in the construction zone. And I want to say this specifically because somebody is on the verge of a miracle. But before the miracle, there's going to be some pushback. And I need you to know how to navigate that pushback when it comes. Nehemiah 4 and verse 1. Again, when you get there, say amen. The Bible says, but it, hap but it so happened when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and he said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes upon it, he will break down their stone wall. Hear, O our, hear our God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to the land of a captivity. Do not cover their iniquities and do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to what? There is nothing impossible when people have a mind to work. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? The Bible says, now it happened. When Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were beginning to be closed, that they became very angry. And all of them conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our what? Our prayer to God. And because of them, we set a watch against them day and night. Then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is falling. And there is so much rubbish that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they will neither know nor see anything till we come into their midst and kill them and cause the work to cease. So it was when the Jews who dwelt near them came that they told us ten times from whatever place you turn, they will be upon us. Therefore, I positioned men behind the lower parts of the wall at the openings, and I set people according to their families with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles, to the leaders, and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome, and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and houses. And it happened when our enemies heard that it was known to us that God had brought their plot to nothing, that all of us returned to the wall, every one to his work. And so it was from that time on that half of the servants worked at construction, while the other half held the spears, the shields, the bows, and wore armor. And the leaders were behind all the house of Judah. And those who built on the wall 
and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with another hand they held a weapon. But I'm going to read for emphasis verse number two. Look at what they said. And he spoke before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, whatever they build, even if a fox goes upon it, he will break down their stone wall. Today, saints, for a little while, I want to talk to you under the subject, stay out of the comment section. Stay out of the comment section. Let's pray together. Father, would you grant strong anointing for this message today? Lord, I am praying that you would move us from a place of paralysis to a place of bold action for your glory. And so, Father, we're asking that your spirit would settle upon today's service. Would you allow faith to be multiplied exponentially? Would you hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone might be heard? And at the end of our time together, let Jesus alone be praised. We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus our Lord. Let those who believe say together, amen and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. You know, friends, I have had the good fortune and misfortune of leading a number of different building projects. And I cannot explain it, friends, but the more you do a building project, the greater the difficulties ultimately become. You see, contractors have a way of not keeping their word. Supplies sometimes show up late inspectors come and add frustration so that times there are going to be delays in building there is going to be tension in building building never goes smooth so that it takes more friends than just a knowledge of how to build it takes a certain type of stomach to build there's got to be an inner resolve to be able to will the project to completion because building is never easy. And the reason, friends, there are so many incomplete structures in the church is because we've underestimated the difficulty of building. The truth is that when you're watching others build, it looks easy, but it doesn't get hard until you enter the construction zone yourself. And this message today, friends, is not to suggest that God makes building become easy, but I need to announce to somebody today that building is supposed to be hard. In fact, some of us have entered the construction zone in recent weeks, and you begin the process of rebuilding some structures in your life. And as you continue in this process, I want to first prophesy progress, but I need you to also be aware of pushback, because the truth is that you cannot have progress without some pushback. And see, rebuilding your prayer life is going to be hard. Rebuilding academically is going to be hard. Rebuilding emotionally when you've been broken is going to be hard. Rebuilding your marriage is going to come with attacks. In other words, when you experience snags and challenges and delay in the process, I don't want you to think that difficulty is an outlier. It is simply the common tension that accompanies building. Do I have a witness that knows that building is always going to be hard? And see, one of the things I want to say when you build, you've got to be careful about listening to people that give edited testimonies. In other words, there are some that when they testify, they'll simply start with where they were and where they are now, and they won't tell you everything that happened in between. 
And, and how many of us know that sometimes when you testify in that way, you make others feel insecure because their journey is never that clean? But how many of us can testify that there are times in your testimony where you wanted to give up? There were times where you wanted to throw in the towel. There were moments where you could not hear from God. And I want to encourage us to be real in our testimonies. Don't just test a lie. I need you to test. Y'all not hearing me today. In other words, it's kind of like this. I don't know if you've ever watched on YouTube some of those how-to videos online. So when you're trying to fix something, I'll look at a video that says how to change the faucet or how to change the light fixture. And the crazy thing is the how-to video will only be about two minutes, but it's taking me 45 minutes in real time. And the reason it takes so long in real time is because in the video, they don't show the times where the parts don't fit. They don't show the time where the screwdriver falls behind the toilet. What they do is they just do it with repetition, and they record the one that goes well. In other words, they edit it. They only show you the thing that works out right. In other words, they don't show you all the time they mess up. And the reason that's important is I need you to know that when you build spiritually, there are none of us that gets it right on the first take. In fact, the truth is that we have to keep doing it until we get right. But once you get right, don't just tell them about the time it goes right. You got to tell them about the flaws and mistakes that happen along the way. And I want to encourage somebody in the struggle to know, because it may seem like you mess up more than most. It may feel like you'll never get it together. But when you look at somebody that looks clean spiritually, they they're just somebody that's had a bunch of takes, and they're now ready to be presented by Jesus because there's nobody that gets it right the first time. Are y'all hearing the pastor today? And so let's go back in the Word. I promise that I will not be long before you today. I want you to stay in the Scriptures with me today. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 2, the Bible says, He spoke before the brethren and the army of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the rubbish stones that have been burned. Now, friends, I need you to get that there are three critical lessons that we learn from this juncture in Nehemiah's building process. And the first thing that we learn is that if you're going to build, you've got to stay out of the comment section. Okay. See, I need us to know, friends, that you do yourself a disservice when building by assuming that everyone is going to celebrate your progress and your productivity. In other words, friends, as Nehemiah is making headway in this journey, it begins to stir the suspicions and the jealousies of the surrounding nations, specifically Sanballat, the Hornite, Geshem, uh, uh, the Arab, and, and Tobiah, the Ammonite. And a part of their disdain family is they don't see the value in what Nehemiah is building. In other words, they see the stones as un salvageable and not worth the investment of their time. In fact, they prophesy destruction to the point that the wall cannot even handle the weight that a fox is going to carry. And friends, this message is for anybody that will ever lead something whether you lead a home, whether you lead a ministry, whether you lead a company, or whether you have a vision in your life, I need you to get that most folk won't support because they can't see the value in what you're building. In other words, they don't see the walls as valuable. They see the walls as rubbish and beyond being able to be saved or used. All they see is a pile of trash, but Nehemiah through faith sees a pile of treasure. 
And the truth is, friends, as you begin the building process, there are going to be some that don't see the value in trying to rebuild your prayer life. There are going to be some that don't see the value in trying to rebuild that marriage. There are some peers that won't see the value of trying to rebuild academically. And I simply want to make one brief announcement that what you're building has value. And so Nehemiah is assailed by these busybody Jews who fill Nehemiah's head with the plottings of his adversary. In fact, Ellen White says that there are Jews that are living in these surrounding villages who do not help Nehemiah do the work, but they begin to become a burden by bringing all of these evil reports. In other words, they distract the people by adding to their awareness what others think. And the thing I want to say to the church is that you need to be self-aware. You don't have to be others-aware. See, how many of us know that you don't need to have a knowledge of what everybody around you has to actually think or say about you? In other words, you've got to be careful about the type of information you are intentional about gathering. In other words, if somebody is plotting to kill me, give me a heads up. But if they just say, Pastor, they don't like you, you can keep that to yourself. Are, are you hearing me? And see, what happens, friends, is they distract the people by adding to their awareness. In other words, I need somebody to get that sometimes we allow outward opinions to smother the inner vision that God gives. But I'm at a place where I cannot allow an outward opinion to overwhelm the vision that God has put inside of me. And see, I just want to pause to say to some young or aged person today that you cannot live your life in fear of those who abide in the comment section. You see, there are some of us that spend more time filtering your post and editing your post and checking your post than you actually do posting because you're so afraid of those who live in the comment section. And see, what you're going to notice in just a moment, friends, is that builders don't live in the comment section. Mm. Have you ever noticed this about Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem? That when they see Nehemiah building, notice that they don't begin building something themselves. All they do is create a thread full of comments about what Nehemiah is building. And see, there are some like Sam Ballot who live uh, uh, figuratively in the comment section of life, who never build anything for themselves. They're just filled with commentary about those that actually build. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? In other words, I'm so sick and tired of church folk who don't sing, who have a critique of every person that misses a note in the choir. Ah, uh, I'm, I'm tired of y'all that don't try out for the team, but you sit on the stage in the gym booing those who are on the court. I'm tired about those who don't minister in church, but every statement begins with what the church ought to be doing. And, and see, the issue is you so deep in the comment section that you're shallow in the action section. And see, friends, this is the thing that's crazy. All the energy they put into trying to keep Nehemiah from building, they could have put that energy into building their own walls, building their own army, building their own kingdom. But for a small person, it's easier to keep others from building than to begin the building process yourself. And see, one of the things I want to say to you young people today is that when you're trying to build, you got to connect with builders and not commentators. 
You got to build, connect with builders and not inspectors. I need you to realize that, friends, each week when I'm done preaching, there's going to be somebody in the comments that has something to say about what I'm wearing. There's going to have somebody that has something to say about some statement taken out of context, and they're going to build a whole doctrine around it. There are going to be some that have something to say about what I am or am not preaching, but I need you to know I don't spend no time in the comments. I I'm going to spend my time building the kingdom of God brick by brick and going line upon line. You see, one of the greatest things God ever did was he delivered me from people's opinions of me. Okay. In, in other words, I'm just trying to hear Jesus say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Listen, Chris, I remember when I was a younger pastor, I was uh, preaching for my first uh, uh, youth week of prayer. And I remember at the end of that sermon, I had preached my heart out, Mark, and a lady came to the door and she says, Pastor, that's a good message. But she says, you're so loud when you preach. It, it makes my head hurt. And, and because I was young, the next night when I preached, I toned down the decibel. I was a little amped up. It was my first time. And so I brought it down a little bit. And so then the next night, she came to the door and said, Pastor, that's a good message. But she said, you move around so much when you preach. It, it just makes me dizzy, and it's a distraction to the sermon. And so the third night, I was a little bit more demure, and I stayed a little bit more stationary. And she came at the end of the message and said, Pastor, that was a good message, but you sweat so much. And, and, and I became comfortable saying, maybe I'm just not the one for you. Are y'all hearing me today? And, and is there anybody that's so comfortable with yourself that you're okay announcing that I might not be the one for you, but as long as I'm called by him, I'm going to be all right. Are y'all hearing the word today, friends? Now again, I, wanna, I don't want to be criticism averse. I'm going to take what I can and learn from it. So I'm going to eat the fish, but I ain't swallowing the bones. Oh, the vegetarians, y'all mad today. Ah, uh, you never swallow a bone in order to get the fish. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? And see, what I want to say really quickly, beloved, is that there are some of us who have made a home in the comment section of life. Now, now, I'm not talking about my online people. I'm talking about the comment section of life because there are some that need to recognize that commenting on them will never build you. See, there are some of us that find our strength in critique. Some believe their spiritual gift is criticism. Some have been anointed for voyeurism. Your superpower is observation. And some of us have become too enamored with the power of our own opinion. Y'all might as well say amen today. See, I don't know if it's because we are in American idol culture that sits in judgment of those who do, or maybe it's the first take generation that sits in commentary of those who play, or maybe we sit behind our tablets with keyboard courage only, but never having the courage to step in front and do anything. And see, my large problem with the comment section is not that you criticize those that do, but I need you to know that visions die in the comment section. Dreams rot in the comment section. Gifts begin to spoil in the comment section. And the word to somebody today is stop watching others live. Stop commenting on what others do and act on what God has called you to do in this age and for his glory. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? So the word says to us here in verse number six, I promise I'm not going to take you long. The Bible says, so we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together. Watch this, up to half of its height for the people had a mind to work. And now it happened that Sam, Sam Ballot, Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and that the what? Gaps were beginning to be closed, and then they became what? Very angry. Second thing, really quickly, you've got to know is that you've got to be intentional about closing your gaps. So, friends, I need you to take note 
of when this conspiracy begins to reach its peak or its zenith. So I need you to notice, see, see what happened is the wall is beginning to take shape and it is beginning to take form. Like they have progressed to the point where the wall has reached half of its ultimate height. God is doing a work to the point where the wall is almost reached the entirety of the circumference of the city. But notice, friends, when the attack shows up is when they're on the verge of closing the gaps in the wall. In other words, church, because the gates have yet to be installed, there are some strategic or structural vulnerabilities in the wall because it doesn't matter how tall the wall, it doesn't matter how immense the wall, it doesn't matter how great the stones, a wall can always be breached if it has gaps in it. And I need you to understand the timing of their attack illustrates a more powerful truth because some of us are heavy in the building process. God is causing your rebuilding to go well. He is causing certain things to begin to take form. And I need you to know that some of the greatest attacks are going to come before you close the gaps in your wall. Because the enemy knows that once those gaps get closed, where the church at today? that he can't stand anything against you, but you're most vulnerable if you allow gaps to remain in your spiritual walls. And see, this is important because there's somebody, your spiritual walls are beginning to take form. You are in the building process. It is beginning to get halfway to its heights, but because some of us only pray every now and then, you've got some gaps that makes your wall breachable down the line. There are some of us that have a growing appetite for God. You're beginning to grow and come to church or consume it online. But the problem is that because you don't know what you believe, you create some gaps and allow yourself to be made vulnerable toward deception down the line. There are some students that are building well academically. You're putting forth more effort, but there are some gaps in your process. So much so that you study always when people are around. You don't edit or look over your work before you turn it all in. The problem is that some of us write the same way we talk. And because there are some academic gaps, our process can be uh, contaminated. There are some marriages that are growing strong. You've made it up in your mind to stay together. You've decided we're going to work that thing out. But because some husbands and wives are not controlling what's coming through our portals, some of us are going to get divorced on Instagram. Y'all not hearing me today. Y'all going to let password protection have y'all in front of a judge. I'm going to tell the truth today. And the problem is we're allowing some gaps in the marriage to keep us from becoming everything that God has called us to become. And what I'm simply wanting to say to somebody today, it doesn't matter how strong your gates, it doesn't matter how powerful your design, it doesn't matter how immense the architecture, you can always be defeated as long as you have gaps that the enemy is able to penetrate in your life. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Third thing we find today here is in verse number 10. I told you I'm not going to take long. The Bible says, then Judah said, the strength of the laborers is failing, and there is so much rubbish that we are unable to build the wall. Third thing I need somebody to get is that there's going to come a time inevitably where it feels like it's too much. Now friends, there are multiple tensions that begin to converge at the same time. Are y'all still with the pastor today? So first, there is the enormity of the task, the actual physical labor of trying to rebuild this mammoth structure around the entirety of the city. But do you realize that there is an added tension 
because of the harassment of Sanballat and his team. Now, remember, saints, that the people are not living in Jerusalem at that time. They are scattered in the surrounding villages and countries, and so they literally have to walk through a gamut of derision each day just to get to the work site, and the enormity of the task is made greater by the mental intimidation that is provided by Sanballat ballot and his peers. And friends, I need you to get that it is more than intentional that the spirit of discouragement falls on the tribe of Judah. Okay. See, one of the things you got to remember, friends, is that God had, see, 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 I need somebody to understand this truth, that because God is with them, there is no enemy that can defeat them from the outside. Because God is on their side, there is no real threat from those outside of the wall. The only thing that can defeat them is division in their own ranks. And I just need to say this to the church, that there is no persecution or power that is from without that can hurt us. The only thing that can hurt us is division from the inside. In other words, when the enemy can turn black saints against white saints and southern against Oakwood and this church against that church, I need you to know we're not growing enough in order the enemy to stir persecution. But if he can keep us fighting against one another, he can keep the walls from being rebuilt. Now, friends, I need you to get this. Because God said... To Abraham, I'm going to make of you a great nation, and in you shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So understand when Abraham says, uh, God says to Abraham that all of the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you, that was not just talking about the supremacy of Abraham's seed, it was an announcement about Jesus. And understand the reason that discouragement settles upon Judah, it's a preemptive attack against Jesus. Ooh, y'all, y'all, y'all not here with me today. See, see, understand, friends of mine, that, that because of the captivity, Abraham's seeds are scattered amongst all of the foreign nation. In other words, they are not centralized in the area of Jerusalem. But what happens is that if they do not finish building the wall, what happens is that Abraham's seed remains assimilated into a bunch of different cultures, so much so that his seed gets diluted. And guess what? The tribe of Judah's ancestry gets corrupted. And guess what? what? Jesus cannot come. Do you realize that in the 12 tribes, there were two tribes that had a little more say? Levi, because they were the priests, and Judah, because they were the tribe of the kings. Remember that David came from Judah, and guess what? Jesus would come from Judah. And the reason the enemy tries to discourage Judah is because it is a pre-century attack to try to keep Jesus from coming through the line of Judah. And see, friends of mine, I need somebody to understand this about the difficulty that you may sometimes face. I need you to realize that sometimes it is those difficulties of life that actually create Christ-likeness in you. It is those hardships that produce the character or the presence of Jesus in your life. And so that sometimes when the enemy tries to discourage you and make you give up on the building process, it's because that process is going to produce a Christ-likeness that cannot be achieved through any other mechanism of life. So that if God short-circuits the trial, guess what? It short-circuits the Jesus that's going to come through it. And see, I need somebody to understand this, that trials don't just produce stress. They produce Jesus in you. (laughs) Oh, God. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse trials. For the trying of your faith worketh what? 
patience. In other words, I need somebody to understand that, that God is an efficient Savior who does not waste your time. He does not waste your efforts. And one of my favorite writers, Rick Warren, says that God never wastes a hurt. So that if God permits it, it has purpose. Oh, God. I need somebody to understand that everything you go through is going to develop something in you that cannot be achieved through any other mechanism. And I'll be first to testify that I never like the trial in real time. I only can celebrate what it produces. In other words, without the hardship, without the pain, you cannot become who God has ordained you to be. In fact, let me just say it this way. Anybody in this room exercise or work out? If you do, raise your hand real quick. All right? Now, you exercise, but you know what exercise is? It ain't nothing but voluntary suffering. No, no, that's what exercise is. voluntary suffering. In fact, some of y'all pay people called trainers. Oh, God. Y'all pay trainers to help you suffer. Oh, y'all still ain't got it. And the reason you go through voluntary suffering is because you believe in what it produces. In other words, you believe in the abs, and you believe in the biceps, and you believe in the triceps, and you believe your dress is going to fit by Alumni Weekend because you believe in what it produces. You're willing to suffer for the perfection of the body. But how many of us want the perfection of the character and the perfection of the soul that you're willing to go through assigned suffering so that my character can be perfected? Are y'all hearing me today, friends? So, well, friends, when you build, there will inevitably, inevitably come a time where it's going to feel like it's too much. Tell the truth, you wanted to give up before. I love y'all church people. You've wanted to give up some before, come on now. You have wanted to throw in the towel. You have wanted to go back the way that you came. You see, the witness of faith is not just about what you avoid, it's about what you survive. The witness of faith is when the devil has hit you with every combination in his bag, but after you gather yourself, you stand up on the two feet that Christ gives you, and you let the devil know, I'm still here. <laughs> oh, God, I love it. I want some more. Are y'all hearing this thing today? There are going to be some times where when you're going through it in the building process and you're trying to build spiritually, you're trying to build the marriage, you're trying to rebuild your health, you're trying to rebuild financially, you're trying to rebuild socially, you're trying to rebuild your emotional and mental wellness, there's going to come a time where, man, as soon as you think you're making progress, the further along you get, the further away the finish line is going to appear. And, man, sometimes you look at where you are and where you want to be, and you're going to get to a place where you just feel like, man, the work is too much. I just need to go back the way in which I came. And I want to say this to somebody spiritually, because watch this. Notice, oh, Lord, say it right. Notice when they get ready to give up, when the wall is halfway finished. Do you realize that finishing the wall halfway should have actually been a cause for rejoicing and celebration in the camp, they should have been running laps around the wall because if God can build it halfway, it was proof that God can build it the rest of the way. But I need you to understand, friends, that faith is not so much about what you see, it's about the perspective and how you see what you see. You see, the problem, friends of mine, is, is when they're rebuilding this wall, they look at it halfway, and they just like, man, oh, snap. We got a long way to go. The, we got more than half of the work to be done, and guess what? The gates have yet to be installed. 
But I need you to understand that they get overwhelmed, friends, because they're looking at the finish line instead of looking at the starting line. Okay. Instead of saying we're only halfway there, they should have been shouting, we halfway there. In other words, like if they had just taken a moment to look back about 30 days when they first started, guess what? They would be reminded that the whole city was in ruins, that the walls were torn down, that the gates were burned with fire. And if they had just remembered from whence God had brought them, the halfway point would be the proof or the evidence that God is going to take us the rest of the way. And I want to say this to the person who is discouraged spiritually because I need you to know that as Paul says in Philippians that you've got to look forward to the prize that is set before you. But I do want to encourage you that you've got to look both forward and backwards. You've got to look at where you're supposed to end up. But sometimes in order to get the courage to go on, you've got to look back at where you first started. Okay. See, some of us get overwhelmed because we look at ourselves and we look at Jesus and we think, man, we got so far to go. But the one thing I need to say is never get discouraged by the goal. The goal is to be like Jesus. Are y'all still with me? Now, the reason you don't have to be discouraged by the goal or the standard is because it's not a competition. In other words, I'm not trying to compete with the righteousness of Christ because my righteousness is not earned, it's borrowed. In other words, I need somebody to get, you need to stop saying God is saving me. When you talk about your salvation, you ought to talk in the past tense. Oh God, let me preach you all on this side. God is not saving me, I'm already saved. I'm already redeemed. In heaven, my work is complete and my record is expunged, but what's happening in real time is sanctification. And see, that's why you don't have to worry about how many flaws you have in your life. Why? Because sanctification is not the work of a moment. It is not the work of a day. It is not the work of a year. It is a lifetime work that is not done until the trumpet blasts and the sky recedes like a scroll. In other words, Christ is going to be working on you until the day he appears. Are y'all with me today, friends? So oh, friends, I want to encourage you to not spend so much time looking at your finish line and to spend a little bit more time looking at your starting line. See, I need some works, religion oriented slave who is sad ventist, who has no joy, who overcomes nothing who has never been liberated by the power of the Spirit, who is trying to earn their way into the kingdom of God, and you spend more time looking at your flaws than you do at his perfection. I want to say that if you keep on building, don't spend so much time looking at how far you have to go. You need to spend more time studying where God has brought you from. Ah, uh, do I have at least eight people in the room that can testify that God has brought you a mighty, mighty, mighty long way. And this is going to feel like a crazy praise. But, but if you only smoke two packs a day, you ought to praise him because you used to smoke seven packs a day. Oh, I know y'all going to get mad at this. Man, man, maybe if you only curse when you get mad, you ought to praise him. Because you used to curse when you were mad or happy. And you ought to praise him. Oh, don't get mad because it took you seven years to graduate. If Jesus delays his coming in 30 years at alumni, ain't nobody going to be counting how many years it took you to graduate. We just going to be shouting because you graduated. Ah, maybe you only come to church once a month 
Hey, praise him. There was a time where months went by and you only showed up on Easter, Sabbath, or Sunday. Maybe you only pray three times a week, but there's three times more a week than you used to pray. And what I'm saying to somebody is never get arrogant because of progress. Never pat yourself on the back because of progress. But let progress be your fuel because he which has begun a good work in you shall continue it until the day of Jesus. Can somebody testify like the old saints? I'm not all that I ought to be. Ah, but I'm better than what I used to be. Can somebody testify he ain't done with me yet? Ah, but can you praise him that he's still at work in your life? And it does not yet appear what we shall be. But the promise is that when he shall appear, we shall be like him and see him like he is. And guess what? If you don't give up on God, God won't give up on you. Somebody praise him for the progress. Praise him that you pray a little bit more. You study a little bit more. You forgive a little bit more. Man, you don't curse. You hunk your heart. Come on now. Praise him for how he's growing you in your life. Listen, I remember I was first learning how to swim. And, and, and I was, you know, used to being there in the shallow end where I could stand up. But then I remember the first time I, they put me over in the deep end and you had to swim all the way across. And, and I remember, Jeff, that I got about halfway in the water. And then all of a sudden, man, I got freaked out because I realized I was halfway in the deep end. Man, and I got so discouraged by how far I had to go that I got paralyzed and I just started dog pedaling where I was. And it's crazy because I look back to try to go back the way to where I came, but the, the lifeguard began to shout that you're right there in the middle. It's gonna take you just as more energy to go back as it would be if you just went forward. But I'm so uh, scared that I'm dog paddling because I'm looking at how far I have to go. And guess what? I'm losing energy by just studying how far I have to go. And he says, if you came half the way, he's saying you can make it the rest of the way. And I remember the one thing the lifeguard did is he didn't make it easy for me. He didn't pull me out of the deep end. But because he was a good lifeguard, what he did was he jumped in the pool next to me. And he says, let's swim it together. And together, we gonna get to the other side. Y'all missed it. Jesus sees you at the halfway point. He's saying, it'll take too much strength to go back. If I bought you this far, I'll take you the rest of the way. But can anybody praise him that Jesus doesn't just tell you to go to the other end, but our lifeguard jumped down in Golgotha jumped down in Nazareth and said, I'll swim with you and we'll get to the other side together. Praise him for the lifeguard. That is Jesus Christ. Amen, amen. And listen, I just stopped by to let some struggling person in their faith, struggling in your morality, struggling with your convictions, you make it one step forward and you take it two steps back. I just want to remind you that nobody gets it right on the first take. I don't want you to be impressed by this suit, this title, this oration, or, or the fact that I'm here. I need you to know I'm just a person that kept making takes. That said, Lord, I'm going to put my hand in your hand. And I told God, even here uh, in 1998, I'm going to put my hand in your hand and like Jacob, I won't let you go until you bless me. And I want to encourage some soul that's overwhelmed, that feels like giving up, that wants to go back the way you came, that he's brought you too far to leave you. God is saying to somebody, don't go back. I want you to move ahead. 
I want you to know the blessing is in front of you. It is not in the way that you came. And he that has begun a good work in you is going to continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. as a church we're standing to our feet the spirit is speaking to somebody today somebody's and you've been having this inner conversation with God that says, I want to give you my life, but I've got to get some things right first. I've got to get some things together first. And it is such a flawed equation because you've made your righteousness a prerequisite for receiving his. And that's not how it works. You don't clean yourself up to come to God. You come just like you are. Flaws and all. 
defects, crevices of soul. None of it matters to him. The only thing that matters to him about you is the soul that he wants to live with in eternity. He died for that soul and it was not contingent upon your behavior. That's why the Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He made the first move. He's already decided on your behalf. He just needs you to decide toward him. Hey family, that word helped me. It nourished me. It spoke directly to me. And it may have been a challenging word to hear, but I got the challenge first and I simply share with you what God has given to me. So listen, if this word helped you, if it encouraged you, if it nourished you, if it challenged you, just do me one favor. If you're watching on YouTube, copy the link, send it to two or three people. Be a digital disciple, be an Apple apostle, be an electronic evangelist. Don't keep it to yourself, share it with somebody. And guess what, man? I'm praying that you have a productive and fruitful week of building. And I look forward to seeing you next time in the construction zone.